Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 202. Do, u, do, uno, do, dos, zero, dos. As you can see, my Spanish is getting a bit rusty over the weekend, or is a bit rusty, or has been a bit rusty, or is becoming a bit rusty, whatever it may be. Welcome back, Monday morning, another episode of the show. Hope you guys are doing well. I've got my coffee in hand. The sun is shining from one side of the room here. The other side of the room is a blank wall because that's where the kitchen is. It's all one big room, not a separate kitchen. I'm really sad about that. But hey-ho, that is life. We're going to make some changes very, very soon. Hope you guys have had a good weekend and stuff like that. I've had a really good one. Um, as you can tell, my um, allergies have not slowed down at the uh, you know the least over the weekend. Um, it might be uh, in part some reason due to the fact that I was running outside. It might be partly because I was sitting in the park on Sunday for the most part for like six hours, chilling out, looking at the sun, eating shit and just relaxing. It might be all those kind of things. Or it just might be the fact that my allergies are an absolute B-I-T-C-H. Regardless of that fact, I'm here standing strong, talking to you live from East London somewhere in the depths of East London, maybe near Stratford, maybe near Bethnal Green, maybe near Maryland. You never know where I might be, but somewhere in East London coming at you live and direct. Um, as always, I've had a very productive mon- Monday morning so far. Um, I've w- woken up in the morning at half at six, no, like, you know, uh, half five, sorry, this morning. Left the house at around six, went for a run, a little three and a half mile run. At the moment, I'm start. I've I've started to use a Strava. I'm not sure if you guys use Strava, but um, it's a running app similar to like a Nike Run Club. But I kind of prefer the Strava interface a little bit better. Um, it's a little bit more plain. So is that correct way to say it? Can you see it on the screen there? Is it focusing in? There we go. Yeah, it's a little bit. It's a little bit plainer than um than the Nike app. Easier to use. I love the little um. I love the little design or UX kind of interface things that, you know, help you with your running. It's got little bars on here for every day of the week. So if you run every single day of the week, I'm assuming each bar will kind of go up. Like the green bar shows you how many times you've been running during that week, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's a fairly simple interface. You press record. It just gets your GPS location. You press hit start and it kind of away you go. Do you know what I mean? Nothing crazy about it. And I really like the interface so far. Um, yeah, so far I've been using it. It's not too bad. It doesn't um, You don't get those stupid announcements that you get in other apps. I'm sure I can make, there's no, so far I've not been getting indication whether or not I've, whether I've done the mile or not. That's the only problem I have with it. It doesn't actually say where, when you've done the mile, but I'm sure that might be a, a paid for feature, I'm assuming. Right? They might, you know, right? You know, cause you know, when you're running with Nike Run Club, it tells you when you run a mile and it kind of gives you a roundup of like your average time, how far you run, blah, blah. You don't really get that with, um, with the Nike Run Club. I'm assuming it's something that you have to pay for. But other than that, fairly good app. It's got quite a cool social function on the, on the home feed. You get to see everyone else in your social group that's kind of been running or doing other things as well in their kind of life, blah, 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 which I don't necessarily care about for the most part. There's a following tab here. You can kind of go, yeah, there's a following tab there. You kind of go down and kind of look at stuff. But yeah, it's, it's pretty cool app. I quite like it. I've, I really enjoyed using it so far. And I feel I'm going to continue using it um, ongoing. So I had that three and a half mile run then i quickly popped into little did some like weekly shopping some salads and fruits and stuff i'm gonna need for the week and then come came back today and made some scrambled eggs and some spinach with a couple of frankfurters and some uh nando's uh mayo the little peri peri one and that's it basically a really healthy lunch or sorry, a really healthy breakfast and then i'm gonna get into a bit of meditation later on today before i head out and I'm going to, yeah, just start the week off really nice and mellow and kind of build the building blocks in for the rest of the week because I'm going to have a bit a pretty crazy Friday. And by all accounts, I'm going to have a pretty crazy Saturday too. So I want to um, get my kind of foundation in place so then I know where I'm kind of at going forward and all that malarkey. But yeah, apart from that, it's been pretty cool. What else I do over the weekend? Oh, I DJed on Saturday. No, I DJed on Thursday. I DJed on... Is this for Saturday or Thursday? When I DJ? No, I DJed on Thursday. I DJed on Friday. And then I was off on Saturday, which was quite cool. My first Saturday off in a while. I've been DJing quite often, back to back, um, all over the, every weekend for a, a while now. Maybe for maybe four weeks or some shit. So that's been a bit crazy. But I'm assuming because of the summer months, that kind of stuff happens quite often. And my hair is absolutely horrible looking. I need to get a haircut ASAP. But yeah, so I DJed on Thursday at the the bar in Dawson called the Free Compasses. That was a quite good night. They had like a little uh, launch party for a new drink. That these two guys kind of started making a beverage. I think it's a ginger beer and rum kind of beverage sort of thing called um, Lost Roots. 
it's really nice um really tasty beverage nice bottle design um just great dudes who are putting it together I'm a, I'm a big fan of what they're doing and it's a funny story because they actually made this beverage company um as a hobby something they're doing on the side you know usually when you hear people making their own drinks it's usually because they're um it's their passion project right something they want to really get into but this time around they just did it as a side project because it's just they like drinking they like going out so let's just make a beverage thing right? and imagine the amount of work that's necessary to go into it bottle design the recipe labeling packaging distribution to do that on the side outside of a nine-to-five is fucking super inspirational man. really really cool and, um, and again something that i'm i was very inspired by when i was speaking to, to two guys so big up those guys for kind of getting me involved and then on friday i did my usual and these are that tapped um for the night called um for what at tapped at tap east in westfield which was a pretty cool as well um it's it's becoming a lot but it's becoming a lot busier over the last few weeks i've seen i think um as it's approaching a year now since we started playing there natalia and myself um, the dj afro muso we've been playing there for nearly a year which is kind of extreme you know flown by at a rapid pace so far i've kind of you know scratched off a lot of my bucket list stuff that i went to do in a year in terms of kind of going or even that year i've kind of been able to go back to dawson and dj i've been able to play in the warehouse parties been able to play in art galleries i've done loads of really cool shit um i've got random kind of bookings and inquiries for weddings and stuff that's really you know something i've never done before in my life but something that i'm looking forward to do and loads of other cool stuff in between so i'm really really happy with, so far with how things are going um and apart from that that's about it really and it was i do yeah now just chilled out basically and i watched oh i watched uh chernobyl on sunday i kind of finished that i kind of broke it up into like one or two episodes over the over the last couple of weeks it's quite hard to get through it's quite harrowing of a story but again a very expertly filmed tv miniseries by hbo um expert cinematography the pacing the sound um some of the the way things are framed is fucking awesome as well the characters the actors they got in it. it's just a really cool show i really recommend you check it out i'm sure most people have probably seen it by now but yeah i really recommend you check it out really really cool show i'm sure noble probably to find it on most um streaming platforms like hbo go and all that malarkey Oh, and Saturday, yeah, that's what I did. Saturday, unfortunately, I decided to go to a pub and watch um, Liverpool v Tottenham in the Champions League final. Of course, you know, being a United fan, I was cheering on Tottenham, hoping that they would um, cause some kind of an upset. I think because on paper, you would say Liverpool were probably the favourites. You say maybe on current form, they're probably the favourites too, having probably beaten a better side in Barca, even though, you know, Tottenham beat I I X who weren't, you know, they're not, um, that's not a gimme, but, you know, they probably beat the better side in that in that regard. They probably they finished just you know just behind City. They pushed them right towards the end, even though City have spent more money than God on their squad. So you'd say Tottenham were probably the underdogs in that match, but um, but they kind of you kind of hoped they were going to give it a good go. And unfortunately, well, unfortunately, I think for us, uh, for for us um, United fans, Tottenham didn't really put up much of a fight. Really, um, it kind of felt a bit flat. It didn't feel like the it didn't feel like the performance or the Champions League. That we kind of deserved having come from you know these really stellar group phases and great knockout stage matches they've kind of fell a bit flat in the final which is understandable i think both sides were very nervous both sides came into it really hoping they'd win something at the end of the season right i think pochettino has kind of done well to kind of you know stem the kind of um uh what would you say he's, he's done well to kind of stem the hype right and kind of dumb down his kind of influence and how far tottenham can go He's kind of put things in perspective and say, you know, the money they haven't spent and the fact that they're kind of, you know, punching above their weight with where they are and, you know, the, the amount they spent on the new stadium and they can't really spend as much on the club. You know, the the, the trophies isn't everything because, you know, again, trophies only a certain, there's only a certain amount of trophies out there in one season, right? I think in, in a particular given season, there's, there's four trophies to win. Um, so you're not going to win every single one and every team wants to win a trophy for the most part. So he's done a good job at doing that, but you did feel like in the last few weeks, Especially with his reaction after knocking out Ajax, he did feel like some of the pressure that he was obviously feeling for not winning a trophy ever in his career was was, was finally starting to get to him, right? Because I think if you want to be regarded as one of the top coaches in the world, top coaches in Europe, let alone let alone in the world, you have to win something. It's just one of those things. I don't I don't think this new I don't think I don't I don't think this new um, way of looking at trophies is gonna really enamor him to the history books or to most fans in general i think there is something to be said for you know if you're watford if you're walls if you're everton maybe your trophies isn't a beyond end all right you want to see an improvement in your squad or your team 
season in, season out, right? You want to see in the steps in the right direction because you've had so many false dawns being an Everton fan or, yeah, for the most part, Everton fan, you've had a lot of false dawns under, under Moyes, under Martinez, under successor managers after that, right? You've had kind of loads of ebbs and flows, so you want to see a consistent improvement. But I think if you're a Tottenham and you finish third, uh, if you're a Tottenham and you have, you know, maybe one of the best, the best English striker playing up front for you, you have a really good team, you have a really good team camaraderie, uh, com- camaraderie, you have a really good philosophy, you play a really good attacking style of football, um, you know, you have manager Pochettino is able to kind of, you know, um, buff up diamonds or shine, you know, turn rocks into diamonds. He's able to really improve the players. He has already in his squad. He's raises the fitness levels. All those things involved, you expect to win something, 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 especially considering that all the other teams are going to improve over the next couple of seasons, right? Arsenal lost um, out of the Europa League against Chelsea. You know, they're going to improve. Chelsea are definitely going to improve, whether with sorry or without sorry. Um, United will probably end up spending a, lot, a bucket load of cash. Man City will end up doing the same thing as well. So you have to kind of hope, you have to win what you can win at a time it's given because you're never sure it's going to come back around again. I think Liverpool are very aware of this fact, right? They want a Champions League this time around, but there's no there's no guarantee at all they're going to win it again next season, right? It's probably likely they're probably not going to win it. They're probably going to get knocked out in the group stages. So you felt as if Tottenham had, were going to try and do something, but at the end of it, I think... Um, Liverpool were able to kind of squeak by and kind of get a professional, I say, Champions League final win. Even though the first goal was a bit dubious, I wasn't really sure that was a handball. Uh, Mane kind of flicks the ball into um, to Soko's armpit as, as Soko's trying to point to his defenders to try and get in line, right? So that was a bit unfortunate in that regard, very unintentional. I'm not sure if Mane actually aimed it at his um, arm through to get a handball. But regardless, um, the referee gave it. And I guess with VAR, maybe it was the right decision because they looked over and said, yeah, his hand was in an unnatural position, but he's actually pointing to defenders. Defenders, things that happen, what can you can do. And then from there, you never thought was if Tottenham were ever going to score. Most of it had to do maybe with the lack of form that Harry Kane was in. I think that was a big call for Pochettino to drop Lucas Moura and bring Harry Kane in. I think obviously if Tottenham would have won, people would have said it was a masterstroke. But I think at the time, I was, a, I was a little bit annoyed by that. I think if you're Lucas Moura or if you're any player, I think coming off the back of scoring a hat-trick in the Champions League semi-final against Ajax, you'd expect to play the next game, right? Regardless of who's on the bench. I think the only exception I think you'd make is if like it was Messi or Ronaldo. But I don't think Harry Kane is that much of a difference maker that you'd have to start him over um, Lucas Moura. I think you could easily have Harry Kane play with Lucas Moura up front. Um, that would be good. Just have both of them start. Have maybe Lucas Moura play, Lucas Moura play more of a number 10 role or have him play out wide. Um, what, him on the right, uh, maybe um, with Son playing out on the left, cutting in. That might work. But I don't think dropping them all together was the right action, in my opinion, of, overall. Again, you know, managers, managers, this is where they earn their bread and butter. This is where they kind of separate themselves from the pack. So maybe that was something that he really analysed and thought was the best decision, but it didn't happen. And then from then on, I think Liverpool did a good job of kind of stemming the flow, uh, counter-attacking where it need be. And then they effectively scored two important goals. One at right at the beginning, right within the first five minutes, and then one right towards the end in the 87th minute, which effectively killed the game uh, for them going forward. So yeah, um, Liverpool won, you know, again, like I said, um, really disheartening for United fans. I think we feel, you know, depressed because our season is getting worse and worse having see Liverpool trudge around in the Champions League. But I think the, I think I would much prefer Liverpool to win the Champions League to win the Premier League. But again, I think as all things go in terms of fairness, in terms of the way they've played, I think Liverpool did deserve to win, did deserve to come out of the season with something, right? Some kind of trophy. I think that season having pipped, just get pipped to the, Champions, to the Premier League by Man City, and again, like I said, Man City are going to spend more money than God this summer again to re-strengthen their side. I think they've done a really good job. And, you know, again, I think that final was a evidence, was kind of a showcase of two of the best, well, two of the most well-run clubs in the league, isn't it? Right? Battling out for Champions League place. No coincidence, really, right? Two well-run clubs really doing the bits and really smashing it. And then the other side, the Europa League side, you've got two clubs that are not that well-run, but irrespective of how L- uh not well run they are they still manage to sometimes get to those kind of stages of the competition Chelsea being the one of them it's like I never understand the Chelsea thing right they have a change room that's of decidedly split um please car going by yeah they have a change room that's always split up that's kind of split in a the camp they have uh, managers that are you know quite volatile and don't necessarily get on with the most players they have a boardroom that's you know hit or miss they have an owner that's a little bit you know ephemeral and then that's the yet yeah, they somehow always kind of get to the end of the champions league yeah, some, sometimes always get to the end of a cup run 
and are there competing there or thereabouts. It's a very, very bizarre thing they're able to do. But I guess maybe that's the cultivation of years and years of strong personalities in their squad that's able to kind of like trudge along. Because you feel like Chelsea, apart from any club in the Premier League, are probably the only one that could probably get away with having an entire season you know, managed by a caretaker manager or managed by, you know, an, an under-18 manager. And they'll do perfectly just fine. They have enough personalities in that squad to kind of figure shit out as they go along. But yeah, Liverpool won. Congratulations to them. I think next season will be interesting to see how they go about things. I think Klopp has obviously shown that he's probably one of the best managers in the world, if not Europe, with the way he's able to kind of, you know, to, um, uh, put together a squad full of players that, you know, for on paper are quite average, but then bring their levels up, you know, considerable amounts, sprinkling in of quality here and there. And, you know, if he's back again in the Champions Windows and is able to add a few more World Star players in there, they're going to be a real, real, real threat uh, to the league overall going forward. So, yeah, um, crash to them. And, yeah, um, it helps to be a United fan nowadays. Um, next on the list here, what else do we have? Um, oh, actually, no, I'm going to close the window because this is too noisy here. Bear me one second. I find it really strange how flipping loud it is in this fucking house without, like, I've literally closed the window and it just feels like, you know, now I'm in a studio all of a sudden. It's so noisy here, man. It's incredible. I can't wait to move. But anyway, um, in other news, um, Anti Joshua lost against um, AJ Ruiz the other day, like a very, very, very surprising upset. Uh, something I don't think anyone had any idea was going to happen. I think the odds on this actually happening were, you know, ridiculous how high the odds were. Anthony Ruiz coming into this. And I think what makes this story really, really interesting is I guess it speaks for um, life in general, right? The idea of always being prepared, the idea of never underestimating your opponent, never taking for granted opportunities you get given, um, always trying to do the best with what you have, blah, 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 right? I think this speaks to it because... Again, I'm speaking to this. I'm speaking about this like not. I'm not. I'm not like a boxing expert, right? I'm coming into just as like a fan of fighting, and I saw the. I saw the press conferences beforehand. I saw how um, some of the fans or some of the pundits were treating AJ Ruiz. I saw how calm and nonchalant um, Andy Joshua was. Right, he was taking things very easily, very lightly. He didn't think he'll be much of a test, and something about it kind of irked me. I didn't really think it was respectful of AJ Ruiz, I think maybe he took it for granted, and I think maybe AJ Ruiz is, um, you know, laid back the mule, the fact that he looks the way he looks, and the fact that he wasn't really, you know, there was enough, there was nothing personal in this fight, there wasn't like, um, they had some ill will or some bad feelings towards each other, it was just two fighters fighting in a ring, because in, in effect, um, Joshua was meant to fight Big Baby Miller, right, and um, Miller obviously got popped for um, PD, PDs before the fight, and Ruiz kind of stepped up when no one else would and took the fight, right? So a lot of people wouldn't have taken the fight because they wouldn't want to be allowed to slaughter without a full training camp. But I think I read recently that Ruiz had just come off a big win, I think four weeks prior. So he was already quite in fighting shape. I think he won that that fight in the, maybe the fourth or seventh round too. Um, so maybe he didn't take that much damage and he felt like, you know, he was he was kind of springing his step. And I've, and I've seen a lot of fighters say, if you win a get, if you win a box, obviously if you win a fight, it's different. If you lose, probably not. There's not not the right time to have a rematch. Not not the right time to have another a fight. But I've heard a lot of fighters say, if you win, especially via knockout or via TKO, and you the adrenaline is still running, you could fight literally again the next on the same night and probably win again. So the fact that he stepped up was probably an indication of how confident he felt in his ability because he was like, you know, the, the energy and the, the fuse that was surging through his body, especially coming off the back of a big win. But facing someone like an anti Joshua wasn't, you know, again, for him, wasn't an easy an easy um, challenge to accept because, you know, effectively, if anti Joshua did what he what he should have done, he would have destroyed him in a few rounds and, you know, Ruiz would have come out of it, yes, with a big payday, but also feeling a little bit embarrassed, right? Having not really kind of given his given his best effort forward, not, no full training camp, blah, 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 blah. But as it turns out, Ruiz ends up um, shocking the world and knocking uh, or, or, you know, or finishing um, Anthony Joshua with a TKO um, in the seventh round. I think they knock each other down. To, no, uh, he knocks him. He knocks Anthony Joshua down twice in the third. No, twice in the third? No, once in the third. I don't know. Is it three times? Maybe three times. I don't know, he knocks him down a few times and it finishes off in the seventh round. And yeah, a shocking, shocking turn of events. But like I said... <laughs> 
a really clear indication on just how important it is to never take your opponent for granted, never take your chances for granted, and always, always trying to put your best foot forward. And I think what it speaks for for me in my career, or the things that I'm doing, it speaks on the idea that, you know, you have a small window in life, right, to kind of really irk out the most of your opportunities you're given, right? We're not on this earth for a long time. Opportunities are not, you know, they're not unlimited they come your way in small doses and you really have to take advantage of them whilst they're in front of you because you never know when they're going to come back around again i think in terms of aj ruiz's case he took advantage of the opportunity to kind of come in and shock the world win some belts write his name into history if he goes on to then lose in a rematch getting severely knocked out or getting palmed by somebody else in between that because i think there's a rematch clause automatically triggered in these in these contracts when they sign them before the fight so so if if joshua loses that he can automatically go and re um try to fight this guy again if this happens fair enough but he's already written his name into the history books and i guess for joshua what it goes to show is that you know with boxing being the way it is where they always are avoiding each other you know which is not which is something that a lot of fans have been annoyed by we don't really get to see the fights we want to see because promoters kind of you know stick their noses in fighters sometimes get a little bit aspirational and try to think of their start charting their career of finishing their career off with a, with a zero in the same way Mayweather did the kind of engineering your wins and making sure you only fight a people of a certain caliber and kind of pad your record I think because of this what ends up happening is that we're living in an age where I think people's appetite for fights and for content in general is so feverish, right? People are binging on Netflix shows. People are, you know, um, leaking episodes of Game of Thrones ahead of time so you can watch it, you know, back to back. There are all these things happening that are really showing people's first for fights or fights first for content in the immediacy is really high. So I don't think you can get away with doing what you did in the past. So I think because of that, loads of little signals are going to get thrown out in the universe, right? Stuff like this with AJ, with the AJ Ruiz where Eddie Hearn, for the most part, was trying to manoeuvre um, Joshua's career in a way where he wouldn't have to fight either Fury or Wilder until the very, very end, right? Maybe until Wilder progressed in the years a little bit more or his power started to diminish, maybe when Fury started to come, become a little bit more disinterested in boxing or maybe when he, you know, decides to fade away, that's when Joshua would finally get those fights. And I guess what this shows now is that you can't do that because effectively what this fight has done is probably hurt Joshua more that he lost to Ruiz and it would have done if he lost to Wilder or Fury. I would say in my experience because Wilder and Fury are, again, rated as the top two heavyweights in the division. Maybe they're all joint first or joint first and second. I don't know where, how you're going to group them. But if Joshua would have lost to Wilder or Fury, that's, there's no shame in that because his, his automatic bounce back fight would have been either one. So if, if he would have lost to Joshua, I mean, if Joshua would have lost to Wilder, he could have easily come back around and fought Fury, right? Or fought Ortiz. And then fought Fury and then fought um, Wilder again. But with this fight, yes, he's going to get triggered with a Ruiz automatic rematch. But it, it essentially puts the Joshua Wilder of Fury fight out in the dust because he doesn't have any bargaining chips to come in and negotiate with, right? I think Wilder's already confirmed that he's going to fight Ortiz again for a second time. If he get, is able to get through Ortiz, he'll then go and have a rematch with Fury. And essentially, they're going to be competing in and amongst each other with Joshua still on the outside periphery, looking looking on in, which again is go, is kind of painful considering just how much he kind of wants to write his name into the boxing uh, halls of fame or the boxing you know, history books. But another thing that could happen is that this could also signal the change in the attitude towards um, perfect records in boxing, which I've always thought is a little bit of a silly thing to uh, purport or to like, like claim as any sort of, you know, superiority of other fighters i think the fact that promoters are mostly in, involved in how fights are scheduled or how fights are put together having a zero record or having an undefeated record doesn't really prove anything or it just proves that you have a better you know a promotion team around you than the other guy maybe has right well he maybe has to take fights on because he has to take as many fights as he can that come his way to earn a living or to build up his profile if you're a boxer that has a good team behind you you have sky backing you you have all these other sponsors under armor you could potentially come you know you potentially be a little bit more strategic in how you approach things but i'm hoping this joshua loss can maybe signal a change in people's attitudes towards it. Fighters' attitudes more so, because I think fighters are the ones that are bothered a lot about the fact that to be undefeated. But I think for the most part, fans don't care, right? Joshua beat Joshua got got felled. He had, he lost this fight against AJ Ruiz, but you know he's the epitome of the perfect specimen, right? Ripped, tall, powerful, good uh good speaker, good on camera, uh speaks well. Sorry, is uh good on TV, good on video. 
this is the epitome of a comeback story, right? There, I'm probably sure there's people in the audience who hate um, Andrew Joshua and think that, you know, he's a little bit too perfect, he's a little bit too polished, they probably wanted to see him kind of knocked off his perch. This is the perfect redemption story, right? He falls down, and now he's an opportunity to get back up again. So I think it could nest, it could um, definitely change the way people view um, the way people view boxing and how records are kind of held, especially because considering in the third round he knocked him down once, right? Got too confident, rushed back in again, and again, um, as you've seen in the most fights, when you knock someone down and rush back in again, you're always sensible for a knockdown yourself and. I think in the exchanges, what we saw was that, I think we saw it a little bit as well in the Vladimir Kitchen fight, his hands aren't that powerful, are they? Like, he, he's not as a heavy, he's not as a hard hit as you want for a heavyweight. And we know now, looking at it, if he would have fought, and if, if Joshua, if Joshua would have fought Anthony Wilder, there's no way he would have, the, 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 sorry, there's no way he would have won. He would have definitely got knocked out, 100 million percent. We know that for a fact. Uh, Wilder with those massive helicopter wheelhouse punches would have definitely kicked him over the head and kind of sent him into, you know, Wobble Street. But again, like I said, the redemption story is more, a lot more interesting. I'm eager to see how Joshua bounces back from this. Um, again, I'm, I'm I'm eager to see how he handles Eddie Hearn because I think there was a little scuffle about that. I think you, if you guys saw the video, there's a video of Ruiz's team talking to Sky Sports News. And then from the, in the background, you can see um, Anthony Joshua's dad uh, shouting at Eddie Hearn. And then um, you can see you can see Joshua mouthing lung. It's me, it's me. Like, don't, don't, don't shout him. It's me, it's me. I think maybe Anthony Joshua's dad is probably telling him, look, see, I told you not to fix his fights so or to kind of get him fighting his bums and now look what's happened. Um, so yeah, hopefully this kind of comes back again. But again, a crash to Ruiz, what a fucking amazing story. To come in the way he did, look the way he does, considering who he was fighting, like body-wise, composition-wise. But again, as we see in boxing, man, puncher's chance, that spirit, that heart is probably the main thing that kind of gets you forward in boxing, not necessarily what you look like or how you're probably built in the most part. So yeah, congratulations to Ruiz and his team. What an amazing victory. Um, again, amazing, 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 amazing story going forward. Um, what else is next on this list here that I wanted to get talking about? Boom, 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 boom. AJ Loss. Oh, Skepta, Skepta, Skepta. Uh, are you guys listening to the new Skepta album? I am. It's incredible. Easily one of his best works. Um, I say I probably enjoy it a lot more than Konnichiwa. I know Konnichiwa was very, very popular um, with most people. Um, obviously, it streamed really well. But I think I enjoy Ignorance is Bliss a lot more than Konnichiwa. It's, just, it's, it's recently just come out the other day. Really, really solid album. Um, entirely produced, I think, by Skepta with a few other co-producing credits here and there. No, there, no, I think there's a few. No, I think there's three or four songs I produced by other people. Yeah. I know the Lee For Reals guy produced one of the tracks, right? Um, which one is it that I like? Uh, going Through It. Um, he's the one that also produced um, Lee For Real. Yeah, Lee For Real, um, Playboy Carty's track. So yeah, great album. From Skepta. But as always, the story behind the album is super inspiring because I was listening to Going Through It when I was in the gym and I thought this song is really, really introspective, right? Really personal. Um, it's really touching, quite dark, very macabre. The whole album is quite macabre in, the, in that regard, right? It's very self-reflective, self-referential. It just seems like a little bit of a... It seems like he's come at a crossroads, right? Skepta's finally arrived at that point where he's starting to realise his position, realise the power he has, realise the influence he has, and he's really kind of like, you know, um, sitting... Um, what you call it? Flexing into his seat a little bit more comfortably and re-understanding the power he has, the position that he plays in the overall... UK rap grime artistry scene and then having a look at some of the videos be, um, pr uh, post release of the album and skip to kind of explaining the inf the inspiration behind the artwork um, uh, behind some of the artistic direction that he's taken behind the thematic ideas on some of the tracks it all makes sense and it all kind of relates back to this idea or this kind of thing that I've been thinking about lately especially with my career and the things that I've been doing <laughs> In the idea of um, focus, the idea of uh, putting a, doing away with distraction, and the idea of doing the work, right? I think there's been a lot of conversation in my head, right, around the ideas of just how much I need to be on social media, just how much I just how much I need to be, you know, putting myself out there and constantly putting out content, constantly communicating with others on social or on the internet. And if you know anything about my story, if you know where I've come from in terms of being a forum kid, being an early adopter on all the fucking social media media platforms, having a blog really early, having a podcast I do, I, I do right here, recording mixes, I've done a lot of things. Um, uh, 
I've done a lot of I've done a lot of things. Um, I've done a lot of things that would require me to be front facing, right? To kind of be always on the platforms and always kind of doing these kind of things. And sometimes it's kind of done. It's kind of done. It's kind of been at the expense of my actual work, right? And then what ends up happening when you're constantly on these social media platforms is that you end up being a little bit of a voyeur, right? You end up creeping on other people's profiles and looking at what they're doing and kind of living vicariously through their projects instead of doing your own, which is obviously not the most advantageous thing that you can do. So in the last few years, I've kind of dedicated myself to kind of really knuckling down and focusing on my own career, focusing on my own work. So far, that's yielded some good results, right? I've recently um, achieved, you know, the top goal of having a thousand subscribers on YouTube, which has been something I've always wanted for a long time. And it's allowed me to earn a little bit of money through making these videos on YouTube. So I'm very thankful for everyone that's watching these videos. It's allowed me to upload podcasts onto my um, audio platform as well, which has been awesome. And I've got my subscriber count up there really high. People are downloading my episodes all over the world that's awesome too shout out to you guys um it's allowed me to be a better dj so much so that i've been able to hold down a residency every friday in a local pub around the corner i've been asked to dj at weddings i've DJed in loads of warehouse parties and do some blah, blah, blah. this focus has really allowed me to do all these kind of things allowed me to read for i don't know 47 books last year right that i've been able to smash through so i've done so many things uh, with this focus but i've also come to the point where I've started to realize that it's not enough, right? There's still there's still things I need to do that haven't really gotten where they need to get to, and that requires even even more, and even and even and even a, a level of focus. It, this requires now a level of focus that's how do you describe it? That's even alien to the position I'm in now. And I think Skepta speaks a lot on that other situation, speaks on that level of focus needed at this moment uh, via this interview that he had with DJ Semtex, right? That I'm going to play here for you guys. And again, like I said, I think it really, it's, it's really interesting how in life, right? Especially if you're in tune in your, in your, and you're focusing on your things, you start to realize that there's, a, there's, there's sometimes a collective consciousness going around. Like we're all kind of thinking and feeling the same kind of thing. At some time, some at some points, we're not able to all articulate it in the right way, right? Or we don't maybe have the platform to kind of get it out there to the masses in the right fashion. But then sometimes you might stumble across a video. It, it might be again, it might be a, a confirmation bias, right? That you know you're looking for these things. But I think sometimes there is a collective conscious that goes around in the same vein that you know some runway shows there'll be seven designers using the same color shade, the shade, the same shade of blue, right? Um, they're all designing in different studios. They all have different mood boards. They all have different teams. There's no cross pollination happening, but somehow through the collective consciousness, they all have the same color blue that they use, the same shade of blue, or the same kind of thematic ideas. And that's because you're all kind of in tune and you're kind of take pulling from the same reference pool, right? And obviously, um, obviously interpreting in your own way, but you're pulling from the same pool, so it's no coincidence that it's going to be some um, correlation or some you know similarities there. And I think. This in the, this video, this interview with Skepta has kind of again confirmed for me just where I need to be in my career, and I hope that it kind of brings some illuminating um, notions to you guys too. I'm going to play a little clip of it now, and then we're going to kind of continue talking about this in a minute. Where is it? There? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There you go. Boom. Skepta with some text. Let's play that now. Right, kind of almost came out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, I was that, was that something that was like spontaneous or was it something like about the album distractions, man. distractions man they're everywhere they're everywhere man like, so much distractions and I just like I think like I, I ain't smoked since December 31st you get me I'm not on the smoking thing right now Sometimes, sometimes I even stop the smoking when it's time to focus. You know what I'm saying? I, I, only, I only put you on game on Praise the Lord. Well, it wasn't me, but Rocky. You know what I'm saying? We, I, sometimes the smoking thing is a bit crazy. And I ain't smoked. So I just use that to just knock myself away. I haven't really been around anyone. Like, I deleted my Instagram and my phone. I changed my phone number. And I just needed to, like focus on what I do then I, I really do this you know what I'm saying a lot of people use it to make peas a lot of people use it to get girls they use it for all this kind of stuff like they use it they use it to show off like I don't do music for that like I make music because I really do this like 
And that's something I've kind of very much um, agree with and I think I've kind of come to agreement with the several parts of that interview or that clip that I kind of want to speak on. Number one, the fact of um, distractions and being able to focus. I think that's something that we have inherently been, it's been inherently difficult for us at this current moment, especially with our smartphones and notifications and the amount of social media apps. And I think you get into this headspace when you're a creative that you want to be on all these platforms or to kind of boost your profile, to kind of put yourself out there, to maybe become an influencer, become somebody of influence, become a person of interest, become a destination point, a consultant, whatever it may be, right? You kind of see those as tools to kind of do those kind of things. But I think what ends up happening is that instead of them being tools, you end up being a slave to that platform. And instead of just using it to put out your point of view or to put out a particular kind of vision, you end up kind of checking those things as reference points is, um, check, check those things for validation, which isn't the right way to go. And I think if you remember back from the interview that I posted the other day, um, the Cohen Frost interview with um, Shane Oliver from Hood by Air, he mentioned something along the kind of lines of, and Ian, Ian I Shea mentioned something along the lines of, um, we live in an age where people want to document everything that they're doing at every stage, right? It's too, and he says something along the lines of, sometimes it's too early to document what you're doing, right? You should maybe keep, you should maybe keep toiling away in the workshop, do your work, inquire in the shadows, and then when you're ready to announce it, you can make as many Facebook ads as you want, blur it out on Instagram, get it all over Twitter. But at the time that you're working, concentrate on your work, hone your craft, so you're not putting your work out there um, so soon. Um, like um it's like a it's unripe avocado like let it let it get ripened and when it's ready it'll be super tasty but don't rush it in the first place that's one thing and i remember taking that lesson from aaron bondaroff someone who's kind of been you know is maybe the he's not the, the the most favorite person in the scene right now but again i kind of miss his influence aaron bondaroff from a new york thing and oh wow gallery well formerly of oh wow gallery and no wave radio he was somebody that I, I, that would always that would kind of i think root like quite quite um often take these kind of sabbaticals six months or whatever off social media and kind of disappear completely and this is during the time where aaron bondaroff was everywhere right he'd give in interviews to like every tom dick and harry he'd be on youtube video interviews he'd be at gallery shows he'd be kind of the man about town right and he, he'd like serendipitously kind of like disappear into the shadows and kind of hide away and he'd come he kind of come back and always said oh this is me coming back and kind of you know refresh and ready to go again and kind of you know i had to go away unplug again you know and then come back in and kind of you know give, be able to kind of give you guys this new fresh ideas and i think nowadays we kind of live in a world where all our inspiration is taken online right you don't really take things away from online like especially ideas and things that you want to think about or at least start from a starting point of thinking the idea of offline right so you sit there and you think of an idea for a book or for a party, or for a mix series, or for a product you want to make, maybe kind of conjure it up offline, away from the internet, and then once you want to kind of dig in deep, and kind of um, expound your reference points, or uh, find something that you can kind of, you know, piggyback off of, maybe then tug and tap back into the internet, that's probably a good way to go about it, and then when it comes to the smoking thing, the smoking, you could equate that to drugs, you could equate it to drinking, you could equate it to go, you know, going to certain events, that's again something that's very hard to kind of withdraw from because I guess the smoking thing like with Skepta would be something that's quite intrinsic to his personality, or quite intrinsic to his persona, right? With the same way I'd kind of equate it to mine when it comes to drinking or maybe doing drugs or something along those kind of lines. You equate it as part of your overall nightlife persona, this man about town, I do these, I do these sort of things, or it kind of makes you comfortable or it kind of pulls you out of reality, it kind of speeds things up a little bit, right? It kind of slows things down or it kind of makes you a bit more ephemeral. But when you take those things away, all those, you know, um, chemical enhancements, whether they be alcohol or drugs, and you really focus in on you, you start to reflect and think, fuck, I've got a lot to do and I've got a lot of work to do, really, really a lot of work to do. And I guess that's something that I've kind of started to think about the, as the years have progressed, like of the amount of work I have to do and the things I have to do, do, do just going forward, I kind of discovered, you know, these distractions that I have in my life are really serving me no good. And if anything, they're kind of hindering my progress and kind of stopping me from really achieving my goals. And it's something that you have to really, really reflect on and kind of be really honest with yourself because you could easily, easily tell yourself, oh, it's all right. I'm doing okay. I just got to wait. I don't have the right friends. I need to get the right contact. But it's like, no, 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 no. You can't control those things. Those things you can't control. Having friends, having the right network, having the right contacts, getting your stuff seen in the right places distribution all these you can't control those kind of things this some of them you can maybe distribution you can't control where you put stuff or cool but you can't control who sees it when they see it the luck involved whatever but what you can control is the idea that 
to get better at something. I think I always quit it back to that quote about running because I remember there was that period in time where it was trendy to kind of, there was this really trendy like minimal running, right? Don't run as much, like run two miles a day and that's it. It's enough to use to run a full mile, to run a full marathon. It's like, no, 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 You can run smart, right? Like as I've shown you in the book, The Unbreakable Runner, which I, I recommend a few times by Brian McKenzie, where it kind of breaks down. We don't need to run like crazy distances every week. But the the premise is that if you want to get better at something, you have to just do that thing again and again and again, like skateboarding, right? You want to get better at skateboarding. The brutal truth about skateboarding, why people really respect skateboarders or why they know it's, you know, why they respect skateboarders because we've all tried to skate. We've all tried to push a ball down the street. We've all tried to ollie stationary. We've all tried to ollie moving. We've all tried to ollie up a curb, ollie down a curb. And we know how difficult that stuff is. We know how long it takes for you to have the confidence to push a ball down the street and, and to purposely jump right up and down again on the on the moving object with wheels knowing that if you slip it, the board will shoot up under your legs and you bang your head in your concrete and maybe potentially die we know how difficult that thing is so when we see a kid down the road you know just speeding down the sidewalk right or the pavement uh, jumping over a flipping uh you know, lampposts or whatever it may be, right? Onto the curb, kick flipping off a, off a rail. We're like, wow, we're impressed because we know how much work that takes. We know how much work that took. We know how often he was outside busting his ass on the, on the car park floor again and again, trying to kick shove it, trying to, you know, kick flip, trying to ollie over something again and again. We know how difficult it is. And we know fundamentally the only way to get better at something is to do this stuff again and again and again. But I think somehow with our own story, we sometimes change the narrative. We somehow fool ourselves into thinking that it's an it's, it's not that way inclined. It's like another way. But it's like, no, 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 no. There is no other way around it. This is the way it's done. This is the way it's done. You have to do this thing repeatedly. And I think we have to pull away from this idea that documenting everything on social is the way things are getting done. That's not. That's just showing people that you're doing stuff. But I'm making the flip now where, of course, you can still show what you want to show. But I'm making the flip of like saying, no, instead of showing what I'm doing, I'm going to do what I'm meant to be doing in the shadows, quietly, doing what I'm doing. Because I think over the years, especially with the DJing stuff I've really, especially even with the podcasting, you know, I, again, I'm only speaking to a small sector of people, small group of people. I don't broadcast it to everyone like around the world that I'm doing this thing. Unless you see my, my posts on social, on Twitter, on YouTube, you will know that I have a podcast in the first place, right? I try, I keep it to myself. It's something I do for my own entertainment. But there's something about doing this thing over and over again, right? I'm 200 episodes in, right? Weekly recording, um, the idea of talking into a camera, the idea of trying to clearly enunciate myself, which is you know not the hard, not the easy thing to do. Cause I tend to talk right quite quickly. I need to maybe slow down my speech pattern. But the idea of doing this weekly, all the time, consecutively, has improved the way that I do it. Right? Has improved the way that I enunciate. It's improved the way that I think. The way that I present myself on camera. The way that I present myself via audio. So take that and extrapolate that into other areas of your life. What more could you be doing if you just kept away from posting everything on social, just concentrating on the work that you're doing? And I think this Skepta album really, 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 really um, drums it home to me. And if anything represents just how far ahead he is of the pack of the, you know, especially the UK pack of what he's doing in terms of the 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 stage. Like I saw him play at Premier Air, right, last year, and it was incredible. It was really fucking good performance. He smashed it. One of the only UK people I've seen play like especially rappers who plays without a, a backing track actually stands on stage and raps all his lyrics right has his friends come up on there and perform uh a couple of tracks here and there here here and there right gives them a look right allows them to play on a big festival stage in front of you know booking agents and managers all those coming like who'd be able to book them in other events a real real guy who's able to kind of again expand his little artistry group into encompassing loads of up and coming artists who are able then to kind of go in and do big things and you can see why, because he's got this kind of mindset where instead of looking at the game and seeing all the things that everyone else is doing, I think he mentioned in the interview, saying everyone else is doing it wrong, he's trying to focus on what he's doing wrong and then trying to move forward from there. Let's play a little bit more of the clip and then we can move on. Mm. I'm really about music. And, uh, and right at the time I was just looking at what everything else was going on and just saying, oh, that's what, that's what, that's what. Oh, man's what. Why does he do that? Why did he do that? And it, but without making my own stuff. So it was so that's why I say it's good for me to complete and not be distracted because now I don't have to think about what any any whack stuff that anyone else is doing, like my album's out. And you know, every song sounds different. It's all well produced. And that's a very true statement. True um nothing true has ever been said. I think you see that a lot in the hype beast comments, right? 
I think there's a lot of kids on there who generally have some misgivings or some kind of complaints about the people that they're, they're kind of like going hard at. But I think a lot of it comes down to kind of frustrated ambition, right? The fact that you, especially in streetwear, I think other aspects of life, I think you should take the criticism, you should take some criticism to heart or something you should just ignore. But I think in streetwear specifically, I think because it's such a low barrier of entry, because some of the people in streetwear, most of the people in streetwear are chances, right? They've all kind of made it, you know, just through kind of trying things out. No one's really got a right to do anything, right? No one has ordained you to be a brand builder or to be a marketer or to be an influencer or to be a publicist or whatever it may be called. You just, you know, you kind of appoint yourself these kind of things by the way you kind of present yourself online, right? So I think because of that, there are some, there is some like um, ill will to all the people that have made it who kind of jumped over the gate and kind of made it to the other side and are reaping all the benefits because again, because it's a niche subculture, if you make, if you're one of the only people that make it, all the rewards are going to be given to you, right? Because there's no one else to really give them to, right? You you see it with some of the models they use or some of the influencers that talk on the panels. It's the same kind of 10 or 20 people they use again and again and again and just rotate through them because once you have one person, why would you then go and get the other one? You know what they're going to bring to the table. You know how they speak. You know how they present themselves. You know they've got an active or captive fan base. It's an easy way to go around it. So I think for the ones on the outside, the outside of the gate, it's kind of like, you know, you're kind of shouting over there, barking and pointing your finger and, you know, say, saying expletives to these people because they've made it over the gate. But what ends up happening is that when you're concentrating on your own work, when you're focused on fulfilling your own dreams, there is no time for that, right? Because there's so much work to be done. You don't really have the time to kind of figure out what anyone's doing is bad or wrong. And I think what ends up happening also is that when you're creating, you have sympathy towards what somebody's trying to do or what they're doing regardless because you know how much work it takes for that thing to be on hype beast it's not just an idea that just gets done in two seconds and it just gets thrown up on there it has to go through loads of approval it has to go through that kind of you know critical self-talk where you think you're not good enough and you think it's garbage and it has to get approved by your circle of friends and all this sort of stuff and blah blah blah, blah until it finally kind of gets onto hype beast. and sometimes effectively there's been there's a lot of things i've seen on hype beast that have been reported or i've seen on platforms prior long time ago that no one's reported on and they've only suddenly now got it on there so sometimes that kind of feedback loop can be a bit delayed so i think again it's only for a certain group of people out there who kind of give us stuff give us stuff about this sort of stuff right but or give a shit about this kind of thing but i think for the most part if you're out there and you have some unfulfilled um potential in you you feel as if like there's you you have this thing that you want to say something in society you want to put your little mark on the little creative timeline of streetwear of culture that we have going on nowadays it really is important for you to step back away from social media concentrate on your work and use it as a tool to kind of showcase your work or your finished product right but use most of your time to educate yourself to read to go to galleries to kind of expose yourself to new environments to go on holiday to go to new places and then from then on you can build out your actual um you know work your body of work from there on i think going forward i think that's probably the best way to go about things and again like i said mentioned before um i really recommend you check out skeptic's album ignorance is bliss is probably one of my most favorite skeptic's albums to date from i say from uh yeah i say from maybe what's the what's the one with the boxing gloves all the way until now probably my my favorite one going forward i really can you check it out great production great themes all overall really great enunciation um he just see he just sounds clear which obviously makes sense because he hasn't been smoking weed just an amazing album overall really recommend you check it out it's available right now and then um oh next statement here um jack masters released a statement jack master jack master jack master i'm sure you guys are familiar with the whole kerfuffle that happened a couple of years ago no, last year actually i made a video on it as well um i had some wrong information on the back of it i think essentially what happened last year was that he jack master was playing at a festival i think called love saves a day or something along those kind of lines and he got a little bit too fucked up and the first story that came around was that he got so messed up in, I think, in the green room, they ended up, you know, um, defec desecrating or defecating or whatever it may be called, a kettle, and he ended up getting chucked out of the festival, and this festival issued a statement, and it kind of went a bit weird. But then as the story kind of progressed, and I think I made a video off the back of that straight away, kind of laughing at it and kind of mocking it a little bit, you know, thinking it was funny. But then later on, it kind of got a bit serious when it kind of came to light that he was supposedly so intoxicated or so messed up that he was uh he sexually assaulted or sexually you know was a bit forward with some of the girls that are working at the festival tried to grope them tried to kiss them and it kind of got you know it sounded a little bit crazy um again um, no one knew what to believe and then i think the festival came out and issued a very strongly worded statement around what jack master did and it kind of got to a point where jack master had to kind of come out and clear it and kind of say look it wasn't what you initially thought it wasn't a funny situation something very very serious you stepped overset the mark 
and he kind of made these girls feel really unsafe. He kind of made the staff really annoyed as well. And he kind of, to his credit, came out with an apology and kind of restated that it was actually his fault. He was completely in the wrong. And he kind of really, really um, exposed, um, I guess, the hedonistic and often entitled nature of some electronic artists, right? Where they think they're able to kind of just do just about anything to anyone and not suffer any second um, consequences. Um, f- unfortunately for him, that wasn't the case. And he kind of essentially got excommunicated from the scene, dropped from a few festivals on the bill and stuff, whatever, and kind of took an extended sabbatical, or extended break from um, anything concerning electronic music. And we effectively haven't seen him for a year, right? We haven't seen Jack Master around for a year. I, I serendipity because again, I'm just interested in just how people bounce back from these kind of, you know, public um, blacklistings or these public shamings and what happens um, again. I've, you know, I always check up on Aaron Bondroff and see if he's around and see if he's okay. Uh, I always serendipity check out Jack Master's name on social and see people are saying and whether it's talking about him. And I guess for the most part, prior to any kind of word coming out, because he just issued a statement the other day, but prior to any word of what he was doing and how he was around, I kind of got the impression that people were missing him. I saw loads of tweets online of people saying they can't wait for Jack Master to come back. They want to hear him play again, you know, because he has a very particular way of playing, a very banger, banger, lace kind of way of playing his sets. Um, He has a very captive fan base. Obviously, the Scottish uh, contingent are really, really big on Jack Master. He kind of, again, just, you know, is a bit of a lad behind the decks, kind of represents every raver that's, that kind of always had aspirations of playing in those kind of big festivals. So it's understandable why he'd have a really big fan base. And I think for the most part, most people didn't really know what happened anyway with the last the day thing. They just went to see their, their favorite DJ play again. But Jack Masters made a statement um, recently just now. Um, I'm assuming because he's probably gearing up for a comeback. He's probably um, looking for some level of acceptance of his mistakes. But it's just a quite lengthy statement talking about everything. And I want to read it out quickly now. And then we're going to kind of speak about what this means for his career going forward. Da, 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 da. Up on you on Facebook. So there you go. So this is Jack Master statement on Facebook on the first of f- May, Thursday, right? Um, it says the following. Um, As many of you are aware, I was responsible for unacceptable behavior after my performance at a festival in Bristol last year. I am sorry for the hurt I caused and all the people I let down. The posting of an amb- ambiguous statement led to rumors and conjecture as to what really happened, right? And that was the one that I initially replied back to. I think the one about him shitting in the kettle, which obviously didn't turn out to be true or maybe partly true, but that wasn't actually the full story. There were of other things that were actually of more serious consequences or more of a serious level of a crime. During a 20-minute episode in the busy backstage area, I grabbed and tried to kiss several women while intoxicated and out of control. Whilst many people may think I used intoxication as an excuse, I would be the first to admit that you simply cannot excuse the type of behavior. I take full responsibility for my poor choices surrounding this situation. I'm taking it very seriously. Right? And, have to, and I think when, when the initial and bigger statement came out, obviously that didn't happen, but he did He did take full responsibility towards it at the end. Love saves the day. Um, I recognize his apology. The two ladies in question or the several ladies in question that were tied into a statement also sounded like they took a, a acceptance of his apology. I think he reached out to them separately as well and was profusely sorry. So I think he did... He did everything that everyone doesn't do in those situations, right? He didn't double down. He didn't go quiet. He didn't excuse it. He didn't blame mental health. He took full responsibility of his actions and essentially stepped away from the limelight, pulled away. I'm assuming he lost quite a bit of money off the back of that too and kind of did the, the work in private to kind of get back to where he needed to be. So all, so far, so good, right? Then the statement continues. Some people have been asking where I've been. And the simple answer is that I've had to take an extended period out to respect others, the gravity of the situation, and to work on my health, both mental and physical. So again, he's apologizing and then laying um, down what the kind of introspective work that needs to be done in order to kind of get back to where he needs to get to. I've seen some comments online that are saying that he's made an excuse for mental health. I don't think that's true. I think if you do what he'd done in a festival, right, you have to under you have to assume. I think we've all got a bit fucked up, right? I've got a bit fucked up at work. I've got a bit fucked up in festivals and stuff and done some stuff that I probably regret, right? There are occasions that you do some stuff that's just because you got too excited, right? You've gotten too self-indulgent with the free drinks. You've got a bit too crazy. But sometimes it can be a mirror. It can be an ext- uh, an amplifier for something on that's going on in your new life, right? When you see somebody at a bar somewhere on their own sitting at the bar, necking down whiskey after whiskey after whiskey you don't automatically think oh that guy's got his life together there is a part of you that thinks oh i wonder what's going on in that guy's in that guy's life i wonder what's happened right you sometimes think of that now it could just be him just sitting at the bar on a friday night after work and just having a couple of whiskeys or it could be that something has led him down that path right if that's the case then 
it's it's okay for him to finally get to a position where you start you start to maybe do the hard work of maybe figuring out why you're doing the thing that you're doing, and that takes some introspective look at your mental and physical state. It's perfectly fine. So I don't understand why some people are looking at it as him excusing it. It's not. It's him trying to come to grips as to what led to the situation that he did because obviously it's not normal. It's not something that he'd probably do if he was sober. It's not something that he'd probably do if he was just tipsy, right? It's something that he'd done, obviously, when he was completely out of control. And what led to him to be out, that out of control when you're performing, right? When you're at a gig, when you're working somewhere, when you're in a professional setting, when you're working. And I think as well, there is part of you that is a new performer. I know where it feels mean. I was an entertainer. There is a part of you that sometimes wants to resp- That sometimes... No, sometimes there is a part of you that should be very respectful of the people that you're working with, right? The organizers, the sound guy, the PA, uh, the people working behind the bar, the, the person that signs you in on the front desk, the person that gives you a wristband. There is a part of you that wants to make their life easier because you don't know how difficult or how hard of a job that is. And essentially, you're all working together to make a good show, right? That girl is helping you out or that's that's making sure you've got all your, you've got all your stuff on your rider or blah 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 they're all part of the same group so if anything you want to treat them with more respect than you would anybody right because you're all in this together so there is an idea that you meant to look after those kind of people so you'd assume what he's doing isn't necessarily something that he'd do if he was sober or if he was of clear mind so for you to do the kind of mental and mental and physical analysis is quite a good thing so i don't really understand some of the the stick he's getting behind saying that you know there are maybe some extended reasons that kind of let him get to that point i think it's fairly safe to say that there has to be a reason why he got himself that fucked up during a festival and decided to do the things that he done right well it doesn't excuse it but it's good to in it's good to analyze why you got to that point and change tact right um, anyway, the, the statement continues. It's been important to identify and understand how and why I could reach a state that would result in me putting other human beings and myself in a position of distress, which is very true. And especially somebody that works in your industry. I think there's some level. I think that's what happened with the Louis C.K. thing, right? Even though the story was a bit messed up. That Louis C.K. thing was even more messed up because it was two fellow comedians, right? Two female comedians who work in the same scene, right? You should know, I think, as a as a person of influence or i would say power somebody that's got influence somebody that's got maybe a bigger platform than the other girls you should know your position and know just how difficult it is how many scumbags they've had to deal with in their own career that you shouldn't be tr- you shouldn't you should go above above and beyond to make their lives as easy as you can because you know just how many dorks or just how many scumbags and jerks are on in the industry so for jack Monster to do that was a bit of a letdown right essentially because i think those girls are maybe expecting that kind of behavior from you know drunk guests or drunk punters that know no better but not a fellow artist not someone that's involved in the industry that's sometimes that's that's where you kind of get a bit like come on dude man we work in the same scene what the fuck are you doing right um this is an industry built on hedonism and escapism which is very true i think for the art for the attendees not for us i don't think so we shouldn't be doing that but hey which i have lived for the past year um we live well live for in the past but there is a human element to what you you don't see I grew up around mental illness and alcohol abuse and I coped with my mother's death as a young age by focusing on music, which is very true. You, if you read any interview of Jack Master, he always mentions, you know, how pivotal his mother's death was. I think his mother died when he was in his teenage, in teenage years as well, right? So something that really, really hit home to, something he thinks about quite often. But again, something that he always points to as a deciding factor of how he steered his life around, right? In terms of where he is now. For a long time leading up to this incident, I was using substances as a crutch to mask deeply rooted issues stemming from my childhood, which I think a lot of us do, that I now realize I was too afraid and and embarrassed to confront. As a result, in recent years, I found myself slipping into patterns reflecting my upbringing, which is very true. I think you see that a lot with a lot of people that come into money. I think you see that a lot in some someone like, um, who is that guy, Avicii. In that documentary, you saw how he, he kind of dealt with the pressures of being such a big EDM act at such a big at such a young age um having access to all these different people having all these pressures to in in and in the way he dealt with it was by drinking himself stupid so so much so that his liver failed yeah he was what 24 26 something stupid like that right dying of alcoholism is really 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 bad so you got you saw how bad it can get with those kind of situations um with my dad's health increasingly rapidly declined last year in an attempt to distract myself from reality i again resorted to substances and excessive work schedule instead of dealing with my emotions while i'm not excusing what happened in any of this i realized that i had to step back and seek help to deal with things properly to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again I accept that I can't change the past, but over the last 12 months, I have made my significant changes to address the destructive patterns of my lifestyle and take the time to understand how my actions can impact others. There are by no means quick fixes, nor does the time I put reflect- rectify my behavior, but it's the start of a journey which I'm totally committed to. I hope this goes some way to reassure that I have taken this 
seriously and understand my responsibility going forward. Again, so far so good, right? I don't see anything wrong with that statement. I think he did something really, really cool. He came out, admitted his faults, um, really took responsibility for it. And again, he took one year away. Now, some of it is partly due to the scene telling him, look, stay away. We're not going to book you. I don't want protests in front of my door. I don't want people to like protest by not buying tickets and shit. Like, no one wants that extra hassle. But a lot of that has to do with himself, right? He purposely took the time out. Like, you saw what happened with DJ Constance's team with his kind of foray around the statements he made about Black Madonna. He still was out there promoting yourself and going to he didn't really give a fuck right but jack muscle has kind of really um understood the severity of his actions right i think through his apology for him clearing up through the i think you i think you would have saw if he was a dick right if he was a really bad guy i think you would have saw a lot more stories come out off the back of this i think you would have saw the girls that were involved in the situation really come and kind of really kind of throw him under the bus because they felt as if he didn't learn lesson or they felt as if like he wasn't taking it seriously enough but i think the fact that everyone kind of moved on and kind of accepted his apology shows that Number one, he was very sorry for what he did. And also shows that deep down, there is a good dude there who kind of sometimes gets a little bit crazy and goes a bit out of control for the most part, right? You think that's that's so far so good. But no, that isn't so far so good because people on Instagram, people on Twitter actually had a lot to say about this, right? Um, a lot of bad things to say. Um, here's one of them. I said lack of empathy on social media, right? This is my kind of statement. I think I searched for it and saw online. So um, no, let's let's go for let's go for this statement first of all. Let's go for this one. I think that one's a good one. The guy that she mentioned, but let's go for this one first. So this is a statement from a young lady on Twitter. It says the following: um, Jack Master's apology is only so he can come back and DJ again, as the timing is constantly just before the summer season of festivals. I doubt the extent of the sincerity behind his words. If it was any other job workplace, he would have been sacked and that would be the end of it. Which is a really, really, really harsh, unfair and a pretty contradictory statement because his apology is partly due to so he can come back and make a living. We have to accept that. Fair. But he's taken a year off. He's been cancelled for a year. Best part for a year. Let's say he took six months off and the the scene cancelled him for another six months. But he's been away for one whole year. Earning money, I don't know how. He's not touring. Um, he might be earning money through the streams of his mi- mixes. He might be earning money from production. He's uh, people buying his uh, vinyl, whatever. I don't know how he's making his money. People in the scene might be supporting him. I don't know. He might be, have savings. I don't know. Not my business. But he's not been able to make an honest living for the best part of a year in a scene that in the only th- on doing the only thing that he knows how to do, doing the only thing that he's really good at, right? The only thing that he's actually been able to succeed at and kill for the last few years, right? He's taken a year off. So how long is he meant to be away? Should he have never have a job again? Should he change profession? Should he move away? What's the adequate thing there to do? We have to accept, like I said, yes, he did come back and make apology because he wants to come back to the scene. But isn't that what he meant to do? Is there no level of apology that could make things right anymore? Weird. Then um, the second thing is festivals. Of course, the festival sees Jackmaster. He, he, you know, he's the biggest festival act out. Right, one of the biggest ones are. I'm sure a lot of people want to go see him. And it says, I doubt the extent of sincerity behind his words. If it was any other what job work person, he would be sacked, that would be the end of it. Not very much true. I think if you got sacked for that kind of sexual misconduct or being a bit of a sloppy cunt, you'd get sacked and you'd have the opportunity to never get another job somewhere else again. You maybe not be able to put that previous workplace on your list of references because you wouldn't want them to call up and find out why you got sacked but you'd be okay right you'd be able to get another job again i'm sure you would be able to right so i that's the thing that is a little bit disconcerting i think with this cancel culture we have going on at the moment it's a lack of empathy no one really has empathy towards anyone anymore like you get cancelled or you get i think public shaming is there's there's a, there's a good aspect of public shaming right because i think what public shaming does for people that are social justice warriors is that it adv- it, it kind of steps in when the police can't do anything, right? When you can't get punished by law. Because effectively, can Jack Master get punished by law for what he done? Probably not. Unless the, 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 the women in question go, you know, pursue charges through the courts. So it's, going to, it's a long-winded way to get some, retribu- ret- some kind of retribution of what happened to you. But what you can do is publicly shame the guy, make him embarrassed, have all his peers and people around fans will have a look at him and think oh that's a bad thing to do this guy's a scumbag fine so it kind of steps in when the law can't step in for you but there should be a point where you get publicly shamed then you get welcomed back in again if you've made amends right you should be able to be welcomed back in because again it's not a heinous, heinous enough crime where you should be getting thrown under the jail right it's just the thing that you did socially that was um untoward that was uh, a little bit disres- that was a little bit that was very disrespectful that was respectful of the community you work in the people that you work for or you work with fine but after you've made amends you should be able to come back in right 
but some people it seems not. And then the another quote here again showing another point of lack of empathy. I got another Twitter quote from somebody also that was unhappy with his apology. And this is the following quote from another lady on, on social media. It says, all of the techno Twitter bros tweeting how thrilled they are about the return of Jack Master with absolutely no mention about him admitting sexual harassing several women. Which is neither here or there, right? Because I think people being excited about somebody come, making a comeback is, you know, the quintessential redemption story. It's the arc of most uh, popular action hero movies or movies in general that we see. The arc of, like, you know, um, uh, the hero's journey, right? In terms of, you know, somebody uh, rising up, like being a, pr a prodigious talent, falling off the safest face of the earth and then rising back up again. Everyone likes to see that story. Comeback story is amazing. The fact that he profusely apologized at the moment, he didn't just go silent and not acknowledge anything, right? He apologized, made the men step away from the limelight for a whole year and kind of tried to make... Uh, kind of try to work on himself and try to get himself back in a in a better place. And all we can hope for is that when he comes back, he's a changed person, right? We only have to we have to wait for him to present himself in public again to see whether or not he's changed. That's all we have to hope on. That's it. Nothing else that we can do. So the fact that people are getting excited about it is neither here or there. Should people get excited and then mention the sexual abuse thing when they're when they're talking about it, or should they say he he apologized for it a year ago? He apologized for it again. I'm just excited that he's back because he's apologized, right? And I'm a fan of him. So again, I don't really see. I think the lack of empathy is very very bizarre because again, it just goes to show that people just want someone to get cancelled forever. And then I think this guy kind of summed up my thoughts on it um, quite succinctly, sequently or very precisely here with this statement he made here. Let me see if I can find his statement. Where is he? There. So this guy's statement was very, very true. It's something I really agree with. Um, put it up on your screen. So I said it here the following. This Jack Master hate is indicative of a wider societal issue in which people are not allowed to make mistakes and learn from them. Once someone is cancelled, they remain cancelled forever and cannot ever re-enter society. Mistakes are not permanent. People can grow. And he, and he goes, explains it here on the bottom one. Um, explain to me why people must not be able to better, uh, to become better people and learn from their mistakes. I will retract. Otherwise, you guys can get fucked. And somebody in the bottom here replied... Um, don't want to don't want to jump in and have this blow back in my face but it's a weird mate like due to his current social climate sometimes it's with folk it's hard to tell if it's just a mistake or if it's actually a prologue series or unsettled behavior which I would agree with but I think usually what happens if you notice any kind of social shaming any kind of thing that's a, kind of stem from sexual abuse or sexual harassment what you realize is that when someone does something like with the guy from uh the guy from uh, Shia Compton, right? Um, from the She, from the Chai, that show. When one allegation comes up, loads follow if you're a scumbag, right? When you when you get accused of one form of sexual harassment, somebody else somewhere around the world who also has had suffer from your kind of, you know, overzealous hands or whatever it may be, will kind of say, oh, it's safe now, and it will come out and say something. So the, thing, the fact that this only occurred in isolation, I'm not going to say he hasn't done it prior, but I don't think it was to this extent. I think he has been, I think it's evident if you've seen Jack Master DJ on Boiler Rooms or you've seen YouTube videos, it's, it's evident that he does get super fucked behind the, behind the decks. And I think that's part of his charm at that point because he was a raver, somebody that you can identify with, say, oh yeah, he's one of us behind the decks. So it's it's it's, it's not too far-fetched to think if he's so sloppy behind the decks, what happens when he comes off the decks, right? But I think the fact that nothing else came after, like of that kind of level of severity or that level of seriousness, is kind of evident that maybe he's not as much of a bad guy as we think, I would say, right? This guy continues, but from what I've been told in case, it's the latter. And accounting for one incident, accounting for every shit or thing you've done, honestly, cancer culture frazzles my brain sometimes, right? Uh, like, in no way am I saying someone, anyone should be made to made a pariah and ex excelled into the woods or anything, but it's such a new concept. Where does it start and where does it end? And the guy says again, I agree, mate. I think it's very much a case of the latter here, but why can't he be allowed to learn from his mistakes and grow from them? What does it take for people online to accept an apology and knowledge that personal growth is possible if we get and it's a, this random girl if we forgive sexual abusers and what message does that send to the victim what does that mean what does it mean what such abuse should not remain celebrities for the sake of, of themselves their past victims and anyone else i don't know okay that's a very weird but anyway jack master's back for the most part it seems like um i'm interested to see what the reaction will be like when he comes back on stage i think for the most part what this will show is that most people don't care uh, people will be okay with it they'll just forgive him and continue i think there'll be a small percentage of people online on social the work people that will be annoyed by it but i think for the most part most people the everyday person doesn't really care 
um, what he effectively done. As long as he's sorry for it, they'll kind of move on. But I'm interested to see what he does as a person. Interested to see what this industry does with him, how they introduce him back into the scene. Interested to, to see how his fellow DJs treat him, especially some of the more politically minded DJs out there. How they're going to um, address the situation, whether they're going to talk about it or not, and just in general to see how it kind of evolves over the next few weeks. Because again, I'm sure this is kind of a precursor to him making an appearance back on festival stages and all that malarkey. But I'm, I'm assuming it will go down pretty well for him. But there might be some trepidation, and also I'm assuming I'm interested to see how he conducts himself as well as a person behind a booth. Where we're going to see the same kind of haphazard um, genius behind the decks, or we're going to go see someone a bit more controlled, a bit more focused into his expertise, and we're going to see an evolution of him as an artist going forward. But I guess we have to watch this space. Anyway, that's the Exxon Zinger Show, episode number 202. Thanks again for checking me out. This has been a uh, fantastic episode, start of the week. As always, any links towards me, um, check my my website, exxonzinger.com, found in the show descriptions. If you're listening via the audio platform or on podcast apps, please leave me a five-star review. That will go a long way into making sure people find the show. If you're watching via YouTube, give me a like and subscribe if you want to check me out later. And if you have any thoughts on what I've said, on my topics or whatever, leave me a comment below and I'll get back to you. And until then, I'll see you guys again very, very, very soon for another episode of the show. Take care and be safe. Bye.